Before visiting Ukraine, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was on the sidelines in Madrid last week when the NATO alliance for the first time included threats posed by China in its future strategy. China is uh, substantially building up its military forces, including nuclear weapons, bullying its neighbors and threatening Taiwan. In the context of growing fears over Taiwan, Prime Minister Albanese issued a warning to Beijing. We've seen a failure of China uh, to condemn any of the Russian aggression that has occurred against Ukraine. China must look at what is happening, look at the resolve that is there from throughout the world and should be condemning Russia's actions. The response from China was fierce. Its foreign ministry spokesperson called the Prime Minister irresponsible and argued that Taiwan is not Ukraine and there is no comparison between the two. It seems clear that China's anger is linked to the most recent statement on Taiwan by Australia's key ally, US President Joe Biden. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's the commitment we made. It was the third time in two years and the first time as president that Biden had cast aside the long-held US doctrine of strategic ambiguity. That is, not saying publicly whether the US would use its military to defend Taiwan. An end to strategic ambiguity would have profound consequences for an ally like Australia seeking to avoid a war with China while simultaneously arming itself with nuclear submarines. Richard Miles is the Defence Minister and Acting Prime Minister. Minister, how significant is it that NATO for the first time has included threats from China in its future strategy? I think it is significant. Um, what it really says is that the global rules-based order, which has underpinned uh, stability and, and prosperity in, in the world, but certainly in the Indo-Pacific, is being placed under a pressure now that uh, is as equal, really, uh, to any point that we've seen since the end of the Second World War. Um, and we're seeing that in Eastern Europe, but I think we're seeing it in the Indo-Pacific as well. I mean, if you look at a body of water like the, the South China Sea, we are seeing China seeking to shape the world around it and asserting an idea of sovereignty there, which is inconsistent with how we understand the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Well, let me, um, let me, from let me Australia's ask you point of view, let me ask you about that precisely. Of course, Taiwan is the major flashpoint. In May, the US President Joe Biden set aside the long-standing practice of strategic ambiguity in relation to Taiwan and committed to US military action if Taiwan was attacked. Days after the election, as Australian acting prime minister, you strongly endorsed Joe Biden's remarks. Do you still welcome an end to strategic ambiguity over Taiwan? Well, I think President Biden's remarks are important because what they indicate is uh, a, an engagement by the United States in the Indo-Pacific, in the East Asian time zone. Um, that's very much to Australia's uh, national interest. Now, forgive me for jumping a, a in so quickly, but of... let me just ask you very precisely, come back to that point, do you still welcome an end to, strate to strategic ambiguity? It's such an important point for Australia. Do you still welcome an, an end to that? Well, the, the, what I, what I welcome President Biden's remarks because I do think that they represent uh, a, a statement of a greater American intent um, in this part of the world, in, in the East Asian time zone, in the Indo-Pacific. And, and I think it's really important that we hear that statement from the United States. But it was an unequivocal statement, wasn't it, about a long-standing Australian policy. Do you still stand by what you said, that you welcomed an end to that long-standing policy? Well, the, uh, what, what I actually said was that I supported uh, what, what President, Bi uh, President Biden stated, and I did so on the terms which I've just reiterated now, which is that I think it's a, an important statement in, in respect of American engagement in the world. Uh, I mean, I, I've been asked the question about Australia's involvement, and, and you know, I've said we're not about to walk down a path of, of hypotheticals here, um, but I understand uh, America making that statement, and I understand the significance of that in terms of uh, America committing to the region, and I think that's a really important point. Your colleague Penny Wong was highly critical of former Defence Minister Peter Dutton 
for breaking with decades of strategic ambiguity here when he said it was inconceivable that Australia wouldn't join in a US defence of Taiwan. But when President Biden committed to military action in Taiwan, you welcomed it. Now, aren't you sending mixed signals? Uh, no. Um, I've, I've been asked the question about Australia's uh, position here and, and the way in which I've answered Australia's position. Uh, the question in respect of Australia's position is that I, you know, I don't seek to engage in hypotheticals and that's completely consistent with what uh, the Foreign Minister has been said. Has said. Um, I have remarked that uh, President Biden's statement is a statement about uh, America's ongoing commitment to the region and that is a point which is welcome. That wasn't a hypothetical, but let's move on. We now have the Prime Minister's warning to China around the NATO summit, um, a warning to China, which elicited a stinging response from the Chinese. Does this mean that relations with China are just going to keep getting worse? Well, I think... Um we come to this from the position of um, articulating Australia's national interest. Uh, that, that, that's the starting point. Uh, now, we, we've, we are articulating that interest in terms of asserting uh, the importance of a global rules-based order for Australia's national interest. Um, and that's what the Prime Minister was doing. Um, we, we've made that clear in respect of uh, the way in which that order is being challenged in Eastern Europe with Ukraine, but we're making it clear in terms of the Indo-Pacific about making sure that the rules of the road, um, the, the, the global rules-based order applies in this part of the world as well, because when you think about the South China Sea, most of Australia's trade traverses it. So this is not an esoteric point for us. It goes mm. directly to Australia's national interest, and it's really important that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea applies. But, but we've been really clear that we do see that there are going to be ongoing challenges in our relationship with China because China is seeking to shape the world around it in a way that we've not seen before. And that does raise considerable challenges for Australia and we're not going to resolve from them. Does it matter that the Chinese view Australia's plan to acquire nuclear submarines as tying Australia even more closely to US military strategy? Well, what matters is Australia's national interest mm. and what matters is what the Australian government's doing. Um, it, it doesn't really matter what uh, China uh, says or, or thinks about it. it, it it's what our own um, uh, interests well, presumably are. Presumably it matters the way what they think about our own it, interests. Minister. Presumably it's important what they think about it. Well, in terms of Australian government decision making, um, we're pursuing mm. Australia's national interest mm. and we're doing that by reference to Australian needs. Uh, and, and we do need uh, a capable long range submarine. Mm. Uh, having a, a capable long range submarine is, is the most important platform that we can have in terms of building Australia's strategic space uh, for trade, for diplomacy, mm. for, for, for our place in the world. Um, and, and, and that's why we are walking down that path and to have a capable long-range submarine going forward. That mm. means it needs to have nuclear propulsion. Now, me, we're, just, we're addressing just, Australia's you, need by reference to what, what, what our needs are. Let me just talk to you about those submarines for a minute because Vice Admiral Meade is pressing ahead, as you know, with an ambitious training program to embed Australians, Australian soldiers in US nuclear submarines, um, even to the point of having 50-50 crews. How quickly is that going to happen? Well, um, w w we do need to be looking at ways in which we can acquire this capability as quickly as possible. And that's not just the physical hardware, the submarine itself, but it's about making sure that we acquire the, the submariners to crew it and, mm. and they need the skills to, to crew it. And aren't so they, aren't they, there's a, a range of options that we're looking at. Aren't those submariners going to need a sub in Australia to train on? Uh, more quickly than the longer time frame that is on the table at the moment? Well, I, I, th I think what that question highlights really is the mess that we've been left in by the former government. I, I mean, as the, I as want the you former to stay government with, I want you to stay with office. your plans. We've, we've heard you talk about the former government and I accept it was a point you needed to make, but we need to look to the future. Um, what are the options? It's very clear that the uh, US uh, nuclear subs industry is maxed out in its production lines. There's a similar story in the UK. The US wants to build more submarines for its own fleet. So uh, what are the opportunities there for any subs to be available in Australia and for our submariners to train on in anything like a short term? 
Well, if I can just finish the answer, um, what we need uh, is to deal with the situation as we have been left it by the former government, which was uh, really not acquiring this platform until the mid-2040s. What, what, what we are going to do um, is look at, firstly, what specific option we will be going with in respect of the United States or the United Kingdom. That's a decision that we believe we can make relatively quickly. Uh, secondly, work out all the options that are available in terms of how quickly that submarine uh, can come online. And to the extent that there is a, a capability gap that arises, looking at measures by which we can plug that gap. Now, that, 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 that last point um, raises a whole range of options that we need to explore. Um, and and a, a key part of that is making sure that we do have uh, the training available, the experience available for our submariners so that they are able to operate whatever capability we're able to put in the water as quickly as we can. Well, we know the uh, UN watchdog, nuclear watchdog, is coming to Australia this week, so plenty more to come on this topic. Thank you very much, Minister, in the meantime. Thanks, Sarah.